Hello, everybody. I'm very excited to introduce uh, the subjects of my interview uh, this afternoon. I've got Eric Wolf and Kristen Ann Ferraro from the movie A Deadly Legend, which I reviewed uh, earlier. So I'm very excited to talk to them. Eric is the writer, and he also starred in the movie. And Kristen is the producer and also starred in the movie. So I get I get multiple hats all in one all in one interview. So uh, I'm very excited to have you guys. Welcome. Thank, Thank you very much. So for people who may not be familiar with it, tell me about A Deadly Legend. Sure. Um, a Deadly Legend is about um, Joan Hunter and her family who own a construction business. They buy a piece of property in a remote area by a lake, uh, start digging, and find Stonehenge of North America, unleash evil spirits, and chaos ensues. And when you, when you can end the sentence with and ensue, chaos ensues, that's always a good, a good start to a movie. <laughs> <laughs> So I um, have to ask, how did this movie come about? Uh, you know, as a frustrated script writer myself, you always write stuff, but how do you go from a script to a movie to make, getting it, making it happen? Oh, gee whiz. You know, we wanted to, um, we really, uh, I, I, I am a uh, kind of a Comic-Con and, and horror uh, guy. So I always wanted to do that. My, my, one of my favorite actors is Bruce Campbell. I always wanted to, always wanted to be Bruce Campbell. So, um, you know, we decided to make something that was going to be uh, fun and engaging to audiences and started writing it about, what, almost two years ago? Yeah, and do you want to talk about the Stonehenge and the research? Oh, yeah. yeah. Would you like to I'll talk about that. Yeah. So when we were coming up for, um, with a premise for the story, um, a few things happened. We, we started looking around, because we're low-budget filmmakers in upstate New York, we started looking around at locations and we found some really, really unique locations where we could film and built them into the story. Eric wrote the story, but I helped re review things. Another thing we did was um, we did some research around Stonehenge, and what we found was very fascinating. Bluestone was not indigenous to um, Stonehenge, but uh, bluestone was used to build Stonehenge, but it is, it is indigenous to this area. And so... Huh. In, in upstate New York, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. we didn't either. Right. Bluestone is only available in a few places on Earth. Um, one is, you know, in the United Kingdom there somewhere. And, and believe it or not, up in upstate New York is where Bluestone is available. So we said, yeah. Is. Well, fun fact is the quarry where we filmed um, the scene with the stones. Yeah. That business specializes in Bluestone. Huh. Yeah. So, um, so we took all of these little things and formulated them, and Eric started coming up with with his story. So it, it sounds like um, you were involved in this project earlier on, as opposed to Eric writing a movie and then, hey, I need to find a producer. Will you do it? So, talk to me about how that relationship and how your partnership got off the ground here, because you, know, uh, you know this. This obviously, yeah. you guys are a pretty good team here. Well, you know, it, 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 it was an up and down uh, roller coaster ride. It was every day from like loving each other to, you know, going to good divorce court. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know Eric, this is terrible. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, feedback is a gift, right? And, um, and I think that's the one thing I've taken with me. And we've got feedback both uh, from Chris. Chris was a great sounding board, but also other people in the industry, um, you know, other, other folks um, like yourself who've written scripts. Uh, you know, to get feedback, you know, is the motivation right? Is there, you know, do we have the right arc on, on the characters, etc. cetera? So, um, and, and we wanted to do that, but still make something that was really kind of comic book fun. So are there challenges or benefits to playing a dual role, both, you know, you're a writer and you're, you're a pretty major character in the movie, and Joan is a very major character in the movie, and you're also the producer. Does that make it easier or is it more difficult? Well, as a first timer, uh, you know, producer of, you know, a low budget independent feature film where we employed 122 people, it was filled with pressure for me, especially because, you know, once I had to put on the acting hat, I really had to be able to relax and be natural on camera and focus in on, um, you know, the 50 scenes that I filmed and what yeah. my intention was. And then I'd have to pivot. And so for, for me, it was a stretch opportunity um, professionally, but in retrospect, it was an invaluable learning experience. You, you know, in, for me, um, 
in a lot of these films, the writer actually becomes the director and the producer. Um, and I, I think I realized right from early on that I couldn't do all those hats. And we really needed to get a good director. In. And so um, I could still be the, the consultant as the writer. I could be the actor, you know, and I still had to worry about like cutting paychecks. But, you know, we, we had, you know, a great director in Pamela Moriarty. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's what really helped make it all possible. I think if I tried to take on too many hats, it, we never would have finished. You know, really. did, as a writer, did you write the roles of Mike and Joan with you and Kristen in mind? Or was it more of a, okay, I got to fill a slide. I do this one and I'll do that. Um, you know, it, it's um, when I started, I, I think Kristen was always Joan. Um, I don't think I was always Mike, um, but, but Mike kind of took me over. Mike possessed me. Yeah, I, literally, yeah. I, <laughs> Those, it was the eyes. Well, I, I was going to tell you, 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 I mean, you kind of really did inhabit that role. And I thought maybe you were like, this is who I am and I'm going to write this about me. So it's interesting <laughs> that you, you just kind of took it in there, but it, you definitely yeah, inhabited that role. Treat to the countryside as a hobby and, and, uh, <laughs> and create chaos with yeah. garden, gardening equipment. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, you've mentioned a couple of times, you've called this a, a low budget movie and um, that's your words, not mine, but you right. also have some A-list stars in this movie, which is, is amazing to me. So talk to me about the casting process and how you got Corbin Burnson, Judd Hirsch and Lori Petty in this movie. Well, um, so I think that uh, we could have done a lot worse uh, than landing those three um, icon icons, in my opinion. I look up to all three of them and they were unbelievable to work with. Uh, they were a gift. And um, we worked with Heidi Eklund uh, here in the Hudson Valley of Heidi Eklund Casting. And we negotiated and they liked the script. So they accepted the job. Right. Um, and we were- You had uh, no personal hookups with them or anything. They just- they No, just, I know. mean, we negotiated, yeah. you know, based on our business yeah. backgrounds and all of that. And um, we were thrilled when they, all three of them said yes. Yeah, we, we didn't even expect to have um, all three. Um, and it, we were very, very surprised. But the script sold it. Um, but one one uh, side fact, though, is one of the hooks for both Corbin and Judd Hirsch is that they have homes in the area, the general right. area. And so um, when we reached out to them, they said, wow, you know, I can actually do a movie and go home at night? And they go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And I guess I should tell people who haven't watched the movie yet, because I, I did, this is not a cheap stunt cast where they come in and say one word and leave and you're, and you put them on the top billing. I mean, they actually have roles and they're really acting and giving it their all. They're not mailing it in for a check or something. Oh right. yeah, absolutely. They, they gave it everything. And it was, it was such a pleasure working with them. Um, you know, they really upped the game of everybody on the set in front of and behind the camera. And, mm -hmm. um, and they were just a joy to work with every single one of them. Judd Hirsch was hilarious all the time. Uh, you know, Corbin was just an unbelievable gentleman, uh, engaging, and, you know, he, he actually um, helped, you know, give input into the script. So, you know, part of his character, he actually formed and said, you know what, I think, you know, that, that um, the character of Matthias, I think that he's really afraid of death, and today has got to be his birthday. <laughs> and he's one year older and closer to death, you know, so, I mean, that's, that's the kind of feedback that they gave, I, I, and Lori Petty is just a child. Just an absolute joy. Her, her, she stole every scene she was in. She was cracking me up. I, oh yeah. <laughs> is that your writing, or was she just ad libbing that? Uh, it's, it's, so she improvised. She improvises, and we encouraged everybody to improvise. But she is a master at improv improvisation. Yeah. Just a master at it. You know, and and she was so entertaining. Sometimes we have some outtakes that I just forgot my line because I'm just, oh my god, that's so hilarious. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I also have to give you credit as a writer, uh, and this is sort of a, a small detail, but you kind of nailed the, uh, the zoning hearing at the beginning, the uh, government uh, approval process. I'm like, that's kind of how it works. I'm in government. I was like, how did, do you have background in that or did you research? I mean, it's a small piece, but it really was authentic and it impressed me. <laughs> we built a house once. And so we had to go through, we had to go through uh, everything to, you know, to get that. So I think we have that experience that, that, experience that kind of played into it. You know? mm -hmm. So. Another thing that struck me in this about this movie is the inventive ways you kind of, I don't want to spoil it, but you kill some people off. I think it's a, it's a horror movie, so we got to assume that that's going to happen. Right, right. How did you come up with all those? I mean, there are some really, I mean, everyone is different, and some of them are quite humorous, I think. At least I thought they were. Um, right, yeah, they are. Yeah. Talk uh, to me about that. 
Uh, well, so um, I think when, uh, when we came up with the premise of the script, you know, um, and a construction crew basically being trapped in, in a construction site, you know, um, and, and unleashing these spirits, we had the props already there now. You know, <laughs> the, the props, props were, were very natural. And so, you know, it, it really does revolve around a lot of construction equipment. And so, you know, and not the to, and, and the chains yeah. and, and all the rest. And, and, and you know, it's it, with a lake nearby, you got to have somebody get pulled into the lake, you know. Oh, yeah. So, no, <laughs> it's just one of those things. So, um, it, it, and I think that those were the, the props. And, and then what we also wanted to do was kind of make something fun around it where we dropped Easter eggs all over the place, too. So we found uh, up here in the Catskills, lots of old style bungalows from Friday the 13th era. Okay. And, you know, so, uh, you know, the, the, the area itself provided a lot of the, uh, a lot of the scenery and a lot of the props that to, we, we could work with. Uh, I yeah. think you guys are hitting a very crucial time because people are starved for content. There's nothing coming out in the theaters. We're kind of stuck. Um, did you always plan to do a video digital release or or have you had to adjust based on the COVID thing? It's, the movie must have been pretty far along before it hit, but. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, nobody is, nobody escapes the uh, the impacts of what's been going on here. Um, we were we were very fortunate to get through um, almost all of post-production, meaning we filmed it, we've got, got it through special effects and all the rest of that stuff. Um, but we were expecting to do a theatrical release. And um, as late as a month ago, we were still saying, Are, is there any way that we can do it domestically um, in the U.S.? And, you know, it just, just doesn't work, just did not work out. So, um, you know, uh, it, you, you got to take the good with the bad. And so what we decided to do was train our sites on, on, you know, basically, you know, these platforms, you know, the digital platforms. And, oh, by the way, I think that society uh, and the way they view now is going to be permanently changed by what has happened here. You know, I think, you know, people's theaters will be their home. And I do believe they made ex exception this year where you are eligible for Oscar consideration, even though you're not in a live theater, I, I saw. So I think, you know, there might yeah. be, you know, the character of Mike might, uh, might. <laughs> <laughs> he would love nothing more than that. <laughs> you know, um, uh, we never did this to uh, get a Nobel Prize or get an Oscar. Um, you know, we wanted a fun film. And, you know, as long as you understand what it is, what it, what it is uh, you're going to have a great time, you know. And, uh, you know, we wanted to have a little suspense. We wanted to have a little bit of scare. And we wanted everybody to have a laugh. And, mm -hmm. and you know what? If we accomplish that, that's better than an Oscar right now for me. Although I'll take one. If you I'll want take, yeah, we're not turning it down. Um, <laughs> Speaking of having a laugh, I did, I did kind of joke in my review, there, there's a, a lot of emphasis on beer. People are fighting about beer. People want beer. Is there a backstory to the beer or, or are you just trying to create your own drinking game? Because I think we have something here. If people rent the movie and they drink every time you mention beer, they could have a party or something. Oh, what a great idea. <laughs> That's a great idea. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, we, actually created, we actually created our own beer brand. Oh, really? Uh, yes. And, and if, you, uh, if you tune in to our social media, um, you'll actually find some, um, we're going to be doing some fake commercials um, as we go forward. So, you know, so if you oh, tune cool. into the social media channels, you'll see Mike doing a beer commercial. So I didn't just pick up on this on, on accident. There is something there with the beer. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I caught that. Yeah. Um, so I, I always like to throw some curveballs in on the interview. Um, and so we're ready the, for them. Yes. And you, I've gotten all the hard stuff out of the way. So I'm going to ask one of each of you, Mike, you get to go first. I want to know about your uncredited role on Daddy's Home 2. <laughs> like, I mean, that's what it's like. A, it's a big movie, but, it, you know, it, yeah, tell me it, about it, that, how that came to be. And the funny part is I had a, a, a much bigger uncredited role than I actually ended up having. They cut an entire scene out of, of Daddy's Home 2. So, so most of my, uh, at least a half or more of my appearance there, um, went uh, went down the tubes uh but you know i was just sh a shopper and and so you know when when uh will ferrell is getting his lollipop stuck in somebody's hair i'm i'm back there i almost look like kilroy you know <laughs> like, oh, well, there, it. <laughs> <laughs> there he is when, when you film a scene like that and they cut it do they do you a solid and like send you the the clip so you can at least see it or you just never yeah. it's just gone no 
Uh, you never get to see it again. And you know what? It's so funny. I've been cut out of the best stuff. <laughs> what, can, can you run me through some of your greatest hits of cuts? Uh, what else have you? <laughs> <laughs> Just, I, you know, um, I was actually um, going to be a coroner on Castle Rock. And oh. uh, yes, yes. And, and, um, and for uh, any number of reasons that actually did not happen. So well, if you ever uh, yeah. need an uncredited role for your next film, I'm, I'm very good at standing in the background and taking up space. So we need body strewn about too. So that's sure. good. So now it's your turn, Chris. I'm putting you on the hot seat. I'm ready. I've always wondered when I watch Saturday Night Live about the non-regular cast members that are like in sketches, like they're the other people in the restaurant or the person. And, and I think you've done that. I have. I've it's been fun. on four or five episodes of so How does that work? How do they find you? How do you get on it? What do they tell you to do? Well, it's actually interesting. I worked at NBC on the same floor as Saturday Night Live in a different department. And um, some of my closest colleagues ended up becoming um, folks who worked at SNL. And they knew that I had a background uh, as an actor and the casting director popped me into you know a bunch of episodes and my first episode was in 2000 with Sean Hayes and he's running a marathon and I'm running next to him and we're both running out of you know out of breath and uh that's when Will and Grace was at its height right and he was just you know the nicest guy and I had an absolute blast on the show um definitely this the set's definitely not what you think it's very very small um, it was you fascinating. The urge to to ham it up and try to make that your big break. Like I'm going to run really dramatically, so they'll hire me. Or is it not? Are they telling you not to do that? Well, you know what's funny is I'm actually more of a character actor and comedic actor than I am a straight actor. Um, this film was hard for me in that regard um, because I usually, you know, take on some type of impediment or, <laughs> um, you know, play somebody just like really different than who I am. And um, SNL would, you know, would be a great place for me. <laughs> so. So I've, I've, I've delved into your, your skeletons in both of your closets. And now I, I kind of want to end on your, on your, on a happy home turf. What, what can you tell me what's next? Is there, is there, do you have any plans or are you focused solely on a deadly legend and it's rollout? Yeah, well, we're definitely focused on that because we are people who like to see things to completion. And um, we really believe in the product that we've created and that there's an audience for it. So we're definitely here to see that through. But um, we have two projects that we're currently exploring. One is a historical documentary about two well-known um, female historical figures who were based here in the Hudson Valley. And so I would be doing um, a lot of my filming and research here. And another one, um, we're in negotiation um, to produce a TV series pilot. Oh, cool. We're going to come on those. Um, and then also, you know, cross your fingers. Cross your fingers, a deadly legend, too. And right. And so, you know, the... Starring, starring. Darren Shulman. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I come cheap. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a request for you, Eric, and you don't have to accept it, but anytime I hear a movie with a two after it, um, I think Electric Boogaloo, like <laughs> electric, two, electric Boogaloo. So would you be willing to try to consider that as the tagline for a Deadly Legend 2? Okay, I will absolutely consider it. <laughs> Take it under advisement, but that, that's from the movie Break In 2. It's just the greatest uh, sequel name of all time. But, well, I just want to say I, I really appreciate you taking the time to – uh, talk with me. I enjoyed the movie. I think, as you said, if you go in knowing what it is, it's a fun movie. It's it, You'll take the Oscar, but that's not why it was written. It's more for, for entertainment purposes. Um, and it's got a great cast. Um, and, you know, it's going to be available. Hit us again when it's going to be available for people who want to watch it. Uh, so uh, we have a rolling release going on. Our official launch is this Friday. We're going to be on demand everywhere where you can rent or buy the film. So um, that includes 25 platforms and the best place to uh, get your updates and direct links to those platform pages is on our website, www.adeadlylegend.com. We're also very active on social media. Uh, our campaigns are actively running, and um, we have links there too. So we're on Instagram as ADL Film, Facebook as A Deadly Legend, and Twitter as A Deadly Legend. Please follow us. Yeah.
So you, you're going to get those. You're going to get those, and and we're going to be accessible by 50 million homes. It's going to, you know, just to tip it off, we're on iTunes, Amazon Prime, you know, Google Play, YouTube, uh, pretty much anywhere you can rent or buy, uh, we're going to be there. Um, I'd also just like to mention that our DVD and Blu-ray is also avail available now in all major retailers. It'll be available uh, Friday, June, uh, July 24th, and it will be available on almost every on-demand platform. You will not be able to avoid it. Um, and, right. <laughs> yes. and folks, if you want to, I think this has been the most instructive conversation to really tell you what this movie's about, but I also did write a review that's up on the site. It'll be up on the site as well if you want to see that. Um, but it's worth a check out. It's, it's a good, I really enjoyed watching it. So thanks well, a lot. Thank you so much. And thank you, Darren, for talking to us today about our labor of love. Yeah.